Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to this talk, Spring Boot 2.0 Web Applications. Uh, I'm Brian. Here's Stefan. Hi. We're both working on, uh, on the Spring Boot, uh, Spring Boot project. And uh, when we were working on, uh, on this talk, we were wondering what, what could be on, on your mind, uh, Spring Boot uh, developers. And we thought that se several things could be. Like, how should I upgrade and when to uh, 2.0 or 2.1? Um, uh, is that an opportunity for me to tidy up the code base and fix a few things, maybe? Uh, can I leverage new features that were added in 2.0 or 2.1? Um, and there's that new thing, Reactive. I don't know if it's for me, but maybe I can try and use it in a way in an existing application. So in a way, it's... Uh, it's a way to wonder uh, how to stay relevant and how existing applications can stay relevant, stay on a supported Spring Boot, uh, Spring Boot release and, and have security patches and everything. So with that in mind, we also thought about <clears throat> the announcements of this morning. Um, and we're actually talking a bit about that use case, uh, the use case Rossen talked about um, so how to uh, leverage web clients when you're in an environment where you can't really afford to uh, go full, fully reactive uh, in one shot, but maybe experiment and, and leverage that in existing applications, uh, uh, in an existing Spring MVC application. So <clears throat> the use case here, because we, we don't really like demo applications, so we always try to have a quite realistic use case. So whenever you create a, a project on uh, startupspring.io, uh, that project data is being stored in a search index. So this is true, and we're looking often at that, in, at that data to see what the Spring, is the Spring community is looking at, uh, what should we improve on the existing service, and so on. But that's the only uh, thing here. So disclaimer, from now on, it's only uh, demo, demo data and things that aren't really reflecting what's going on actually in production on startupspring.io, but we took that use case just to make it interesting. So now we've got data coming in that index, and uh, this is also true if you're, for example, using uh, curl or HTTP or any IDE. It's using a, a, an API, a web API, and that's true, um, uh, on startupspring.io and generating projects in the same way. We're adding data to, to that index. So what we'd like to do, uh, we already have an application uh, that, has that, that, that works as a dashboard for, for us to, to look at and see what are the trends, uh, what's going on with the Spring community, and how the community is using startup Spring.io. So with that in mind, our existing applications, and that'll be the starting point for this, uh, this presentation. It's a Spring Boot 1.5 application that's looking into that index uh, through, a, a, uh, uh, through REST calls. It's also using two other uh, web APIs. One is uh, listing events, like cal calendar events, what, what happened during a, a certain period. And another one is, another remote service is uh, doing reverse DNS. So a way for us to see if, for example, if certain IPs would be abusing the startup spring Dario service, something for us to look at, to look at and see, oh, this, is, this IP and this host is uh, making too many calls to startup spring Dario, we have to look into it. So this is our application, our existing ap application, uh, Spring Boot 1.5, that we'll use during this talk. And uh, we'll start from there, and we'll, we'll see uh, how it goes. Enough with the slides already. There you go. All right, so um, we'll share the code with you after the talk, so don't worry. Um, there is also, as usual, there is one commit per demo right. with some explanations in each commit. So you, if at some point you would like to uh, review one of the things we're going to show today, uh, you can do so um, yourself. Um, right, so the two applications are running, so we have a generator down there, which, which is faking that data and faking the, those three services that Brian mentioned. And we have a dashboard, which is our current Spring Boot 1.5 application. Um, so let's have a look to it. Uh, we can maybe um, quickly log into this app. 
and then we'll show the code. So we have this plugin page, let's another user, then I can see this wonderful dashboard. So you can see that we had two events this week, uh, the Spring One platform, so nobody's working anymore because you're all like sitting here and paying attention to uh, the, the talk you're attending to, and apparently last Wednesday Twitter was down, so yeah, that's definitely a good excuse to uh, work a bit more. <laughs> Um, you have the top HTTP client here with the Resolve DNS, as you can see, the very smart resolution. Mm. Um, and for the purpose of the, of the demo today, we have two uh, DNS resolver. We have one free DNS resolver, which, is, which can be slow, so it's not really always re re reliable. And there is one uh, that's non-free, non uh, fast and reliable, but we don't want to pay too much to use it. So you better use the free one if it's working. So this is our existing app. Uh, so it's protected by Spring Security, as you can see. Uh, it's uh, showing everything into one dashboard and getting all that data into one place. But it's also got Actuator. So if you look at slash health, we can see the status, slash info, as usual. And uh, Whoa, yeah, missing, a a slash. missing a slash there. <laughs> and, and if you try and look at the environment, it's protected. And we get this pop-up. So let's go with user and user again. And that won't work because I don't have the, the role, right? So we want to make sure that you need to have a specific, specific, specific role to, to be able to access that information. So let's have, let's have a look a bit in the code. Um, so that's 1.5, Spring Boot 1.5 feature again. Um, so we have one thing over here, uh, which is a, an override of the role that's necessary to access a traitor endpoint. And we have a, our security config. That's pretty, pretty basic, actually. So there is all, 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 there's only one thing, but really it's, it's configuring a form login and saying that every request needs to be authenticated. So you won't see, for instance, you won't see the, the, the security configuration for static resources. Uh, when you have the login page, you, we had that logo, which is served as a static resource. You're not logged in yet, so we need to allow that. And you don't see either the configuration for the actuator, the security configuration for the actuator, the fact that you need to have an admin role. The reason why you don't see all of that is in Spring Boot 1.5, uh, we, have, we had, and that's what we are going to show you today, uh, we had security auto, security auto, auto configuration for the main application and, and the actu actuator specific endpoints. That could bring some confusion, so we've, we've improved that. Uh, what else can we show before migrating? Uh, we could show how uh, we're fetching data. So we have several clients. Uh, right. So we have a stats client, uh, which is wrapping a REST template. So here we're just uh, fetching data from that remote API uh, for a certain period, so from date to another date. We're fetching all the project creations, and we're, we're gathering on the, the, the project counts uh, for each generation, and we're getting that. Uh, as well, we're getting, we have another uh, client uh, which will be uh, the reverse lookup one. So that's where you can see there are, there are two, two flavors, one that is free and the other uh, which is paying. So same way, we're sending requests to, re to ask for a reverse DNS for a particular IP and we're getting that back. And uh, we can gather all that into our uh, service, the stats service. And that's where we're making basically all the remote calls. Uh, so first, uh, the, the project creations. Then we're getting the events. So the, everything that happened during that period, the calendar events that we know of. Then we're fetching the top clients that are using, that are using a lot our, our service. And then from, for each client, we're trying to get its, uh, its reverse DNS. So as you can see, that makes a lot of remote calls, and because we're trying to parallelize a bit things, uh, we're using Java, Java streams um, and a parallel stream to, to try and schedule that work on several, several threads at the same time to get things um, a bit more faster. And we're gathering all that data uh, into a single uh, object, which is stats container. And uh, that class is just a container for all that data. And we're getting, th getting that class and, and pushing that into the model map uh, in our controller. And uh, then from there, we're just rendering a template, which is a 
Time leaf. Time leaf template, yeah. yeah. So we're rendering that, and uh, that's how you see the dashboard. So many remote calls, a bit of uh, processing, and then uh, rendering a view. So I can also log in as an admin here uh, and just show you that I can actually access the environment once I've logged in again, because that's the security of the configuration for the actuator kicking in. Then I can access this endpoint. So the incognito window at the moment is logged in with the simple user. And on the main one, we are logged as the admin user. So we really have three layers of security configuration here. Uh, one that is defined by our application, another one defined by uh, actuator uh, security configuration, so the, the thing that, that Stefan just showed with the, the admin user, and another one which is the boot one for, for example, uh, allowing static resources. So that makes free. Right, so um, first step now is uh, we're going to upgrade to Spring Boot 2.0, uh, and then later, as Brian mentioned, we will upgrade to 2.1 and show you, well, 2.1 milestone 4, because it's not GA yet, mm -hmm. and show you the kind of things that uh, you could expect from this uh, new feature release. So okay, let's get started. Um, right, so I have my version here. Let's switch to 205. So obviously it's a simple demo, so with a more ambitious application you would have more, more things to do. But let's see what happens if I change the version. Right. So if you build, you can see that there are a few missing, few missing things. Um, here we were missing uh, a few web classes. So the classes coming from the spring-web jar. Um, so you can wonder, uh, you can look at your palm and think, what, what, what's happening? Uh, everything, that, all, all, the, all the roadblocks and, and problems we're encountering here, it's all listed and explained properly in, a, in the Spring Boot uh, migration wiki. Um, so in case you're hitting such an issue, don't worry, there, there's the wiki. So here we've got uh, Thymeleaf, the, the, the Thymeleaf starter. We've got Security Actuator uh, and Jackson. Uh, the GSR 3.10.1. And some, and some client-side stuff there. So we're obviously missing Spring Web, and this all comes from the fact that before Spring Boot 2.0, we only had uh, one Spring Web Framework. It was Spring MVC. And as of Spring, Spring Framework 5, we, we've got two. We've got MVC and WebFlux. And you can use uh, Thymeleaf with both. Uh, previously in Spring Boot 1.5, whenever you had starter, um, starter time leaf on the class path, it was transitive, transitively depending on, on web because we thought that if you use time leaf, it was for Spring MVC, but it's not the case anymore. So you have to uh, manually uh, say that you're depending on starter web or starter web plugs, depending on which framework you, you chose. All right, so I just did that. And uh, if we go back to our config, it's better now, except that you'll see a few things like this deprecation um, for the Web, web MVC configuration configure adapter. So another thing that uh, Spring Framework 5 and Spring Boot 2 bring is the Java 8 baseline, uh, which means we finally can use Java 8 ourselves, uh, including default methods in interface. And this, this was a workaround uh, for, for the support to Java 6 and later to have those uh, empty implementation of the interface that you could extend from if there are many methods that, that are provided by the interface, but you only want to override one. So this is deprecated now because you can simply implement uh, the, inf in the interface as you would expect, and that's working ex exactly the same way. Right, so let's move on. All right. So the next thing there is that uh, there is this uh, access override order. Um, property does not exist anymore. And we didn't mention it, but the reason why it, wa it was there in our Spring Boot 1.5 application, uh, it was a way for our user security config to be put in the right order. So to be put in such a way that the, the, main, uh, the main auto configuration for security would apply and the actuator uh, auto, auto configuration for security would apply. As you will see, as you will see in a minute, uh, Spring, the Spring security configuration is much more simpler now. There's only one. So there, there's no, no longer this, this case where you need to order things properly. So um, let's remove that. And basically what that means is if you, whenever you implement uh, 
the, the security hook point, like in this case, basically Spring Boot will back off completely. So it won't apply anything. And well, the next thing then is how do you replicate uh, what the Spring Boot auto configuration used, used to provide? So this is a pattern that we try to use more and more, is to give simpler option and an API, a dedicated API that allows you to replicate explicitly um, what the auto configuration would, would have done. Yeah, so previously we were trying to do a lot of things for uh, boot developers, uh, but it could be confusing because there, there was no central place where you could see where, where, how security is configured, and it could be really a bit confusing um, to think how and which order things apply and how, should, how can I achieve X uh, with security in my application. So we chose the other trade-off, which is um, everything is centralized in your, under your control, but we're helping you as much as we can to uh, write a security configuration that is easy to read and easy to maintain. Right, so let's, uh, let's restore the um, static resources. Um, so uh, Spring Boot will serve static resources at well-known locations, and you, you have a way also to uh, customize that via the property. So the next move would be maybe to hard code those parts in your uh, security config, but that would be really, really bad because if you, if you have customized them, for instance, using uh, that property, that, that won't apply anymore. So we, we wanted to provide you something that behaves the same way as, as the auto configuration used to be. So for that, we have, uh, we have this dedicated API I was talking about. So we have path request to static resources. Uh, with several builder methods and one which is add common locations that's going to do exactly what we've mentioned. And this, uh, this is actually a standard spring security matcher. So the, once you've done that, you're back into with full power of spring security. So what I can do here is the simply use permit all like I would have done uh, with manual, manual configuration. All right, let's try to restart this thing and see what we have. So it's running on 2.5 now. I don't think we'll have uh, uh, our static resources uh, because we're currently using web jars. So we, we're not copying and pasting uh, C, CSS libraries into, into our class path. We're, we're just using the web jars. And there was another change uh, in Spring Boot 2.0. Uh, so if you, try, if you ever try to maybe compile that project uh, the right one. Okay, the right one. Uh, you'll see that, that it complains that it doesn't know the dependency management version for uh, WebJar's locator. Sorry, I can't increase the size on that one. So the thing is, when we first made that choice of supporting WebJar's in Spring Boot 1.5, we chose to detect that support whenever you added Spring uh, WebJar's locator on your class path, but it wasn't really the right choice because the maintainers told us that it wasn't the right one. Uh, we chose uh, instead now as a Spring Boot 2.0, something that is more um, thin, uh, less classes, and, and the actual uh, support that we were looking for, which is WebJar's locator core. So you have to replace that uh, in your application if you're depending on the previous one. And this is a case where IntelliJ does not help us because it, it's trying to be too smart and not show us that actually there is a problem in the pump. So right. now we should have our static resources oh. and everything ready. It doesn't work. Why? Oh, stack trace. Okay, let's see. Okay. Yeah. So it's complaining about a password encoder <laughs> that we don't have. So Spring Boot 2 is also about uh, upgrading your dependencies, so Spring Framework 5 and Spring Data K and also Spring Security 5. And one of the, one of the change in Spring Security 5 is that passwords must be encoded from now. So it doesn't accept you to specify a, a plain text password. Um, so you need to provide to Spring Security the password encoder that you've used to encode your passwords. And if you don't, well, simply Spring Security will will deny any attempt to authenticate. So this is a demo, and of course we have plain text password, uh, which are here. And because we are lazy and we don't want to encode password and then define an encoding password, uh, we're just going to say, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, it's a demo, so we're still using 
this one. And again, Spring Security tells us that this is deprecated, this, this is going to be removed. So it, it's really a strong signal that as from now on, if you don't have encoded password, you should really, should really do that. Right, I should be able to get my app working, hopefully. There we go. Admin, admin. So now we can try and log in. Oh. And no. got an error page. What? Where is my app? There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. <coughs> Never mind. Oh. It, it was probably a four phone in the login loop, yeah. Okay, okay, whatever. So let's go back to the other problem. Um, we told you about the security autoconfig being greatly simplified, and that also accounts for the actuator. As you can see here, the ID tells you that the property you used to, uh, to customize the behavior is no longer works. So if you see that red thing, it basically means that having that line is completely useless because the Spring Boot generation you're currently using does not take that property into account. If you go here, then you'll get an, an additional explanation. Sometimes you have a replacement, sometimes you don't have a replacement. In the case of this property, there, there is no replacement. Um, Why? Because we changed the way security works instead of having three separate, separate layers, two of them being auto-configured by boot, it's centralized, so now, it's a bit different. So the same thing for the, uh, what used to be sensitive in Spring Boot. So you could, you, could you could configure via properties whether an endpoint can be seen anonymously or if you had to log in basically with the configure role to be able to access it. All that is gone now since you, you're in full control of what happens. So I need to basically restore the admin check. So let's just remove this because it's useless. As a logged in user, um, if I go to the actuator now, I can see I have two endpoints being deployed, and only two. And by the way, we moved uh, the actuator oh, yeah. uh, endpoints to slash actuator instead of having everything under the, the root path. So now you should look in, under slash actuator slash everything. Slash your endpoint. Yeah. And we're listing everything under slash actuator. So you can see here that we only have health and info, but we're missing all the others. So that's another thing that we've decided to do with Spring Boot 2, is to make sure that if you want to expose something as a web endpoint, it has to be explicit. You have to opt in for it. And the main reason behind that is because you've, we've changed uh, the security so much so that it's, it's much more simpler and much more explicit. We don't want you to be in a situation where you upgrade to 2.0 and miss that part and deploy the application and endpoints are being deployed with the wrong security model. So now you have to opt in. So how do you do that? It's actually quite easy. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, exposure property you can use, uh, both for the web endpoints and the GMX endpoints. So that feature is still, uh, is still applicable. So you can, you can also access your actuator endpoints via GMX. You can see that the include default value is earth and info. So there you can list the endpoints that you want to um, basically uh, include. And there's a special keyword that you can use, which is star, and star basically means everything. Right, so there we go. I have my endpoints. And my problem now, of course, is if I go to the environment, as remember, incognito is user, so it's, it doesn't have the admin role, I can see that stuff. I shouldn't be allowed to. So the next step now is to show you how you can use this new API to uh, configure actuator security for your application. But the good thing is now you don't need to think about layers and configuration properties in several places. You know that you've got one security configuration, and that's where you need to, to do things. So in this case, just like path requests, uh, there's a separate endpoint request for actuator support. And with that, you can, you can, uh, you can say that you'd like to, uh, for example, uh, restrict or make public things. So here, we'd like to make health and info uh, public and uh, 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 make everybody uh, able to, uh, allowed to, to see that information. And uh, with the other 
uh, endpoints, we'd like to protect them and uh, uh, make sure that uh, users are authenticated and have a specific admin role to access that, in, to access that information. So if we, do, if we do that, we're back in business uh, with the user not allowed to see this and my admin user can actually see it. And the pop-up pop is gone, by the way. The basic authentication pop-up is gone because it's a single security, auto con security configuration now, so it's using the form login that we've defined. Uh, it's much more uh, compliant with, with Spring Security's defaults compared to 1.5. So now we're in a place where we've got our existing application, which is in a, in a good state. We're on Spring Boot 205. We've got the security model reworked. Uh, we've got everything uh, just as before, actually. Right. And uh, now maybe is the time to think about our use case and what we could do and how we could leverage the new features uh, in Spring Boot 2.0. And uh, if you think about the example that Rawson uh, explained this morning, uh, we're definitely in that space. We're using Spring MVC, but we're using uh, an awful lot of uh, REST templates and uh, remote calls to fetch data, and we'd like to improve things a bit in that space because uh, it's hard to make things uh, execute in parallel, and some cases like um, timeouts or errors are really hard to, to handle in our case. So here we'd like to uh, add Spring Web Flux as a dependency, so when you do that, when you have both Starter Web and Starter Web Flux in a single uh, Spring Boot application, we consider that if you do that, you're trying to use Web Client with an existing Spring MVC application. So by default, this will start a Spring MVC application. You can always say that if you want, for example, Spring MVC on the class path for some reason, but you want a Web Flux, a Web Flux application, there's a way to tell Spring Boot that this is a Web Flux application if you want. But here, we're in the regular case where we'd like to use Web Client and we'd like to uh, replace a REST template with it. So here's a nice way to start and, and see how Reactive works without uh, turning uh, everything upside down in an, every, in a, in a, in an existing application. Uh, so just like with REST template, we're injecting a web client builder, which is auto-configured by boot. Uh, so this has a lot of goodies in it. So it's auto-configured. Uh, the serialization, for, so Jackson and everything. So if you change a configuration property linked to Jackson, it, this, will this will be reflected in, in the web client support. Uh, we're also configuring uh, HTTP resources, management, and so on. So if you're trying to use a web client in Spring Boot, please uh, inject the builder. It's really, it's really important. That, that will give you a lot. And we have the same feature in pair. So if you use the REST template customizer, for instance, to customize the way the REST template is going to be built, there is a web client customizer that does the exact same thing. So now, um, basically what we want to do is, rather than returning uh, the data as a blocking call, we want to return a, a promise, a different result of, um, of, the, of, the, of the data. And as, as Rosan has shown during the keynote, it's very easy with, with a reactor, I can Okay, basically here, rather than returning a generation statistics, I can return a mono of generation statistics. And I can use the client to get uh, this URI uh, with those parameters. And it's baked in, so the, the support of Reactive is baked in in the API, so I can, once I've done that, um, I can actually um, exchange, that would be nice. Retrieve. Maybe? Retrieve, you're right. So Exchange will give you the, the client, the full client response, but if you're just interested in the body, in the response body, then you can use Retrieve. And here we'll like to have a mono of generation statistics. So mono is for a, a zero or one element, and a flux is whenever you have a collection, so zero to n elements. And that's what we can use here. Exact same way. Uh, so consistent API, right? Uh, so you do... Uh, this here, uh, what am I missing? Yeah, there's one. Yeah. Uh, retrieve, and rather than body to mono, you do body to flux, and you'll get a flux of those events. There are a few more things to... Um, we could go on like that for yeah. all the clients, it's, but it, it would be the same thing, right? We just uh, turn REST template calls into web client calls, and uh, this would work. Right. So now we're in a place where we've uh, 
uh, Stefan fast-forwarded to a, a commit where we've just changed all the REST template calls into web client calls. So injected the builder, built the, the client, and then using the, the web client API, retrieving uh, mono or fluxes, and uh, we're ready. But if we look at, if we look at our existing um, service, we're not really doing something super interesting because whenever we're making a call to uh, one of those clients, we're calling block right away. So we have an efficient client. We're having non-blocking, uh, asynchronous uh, communication. Uh, it's really efficient. But at the same time, we're not making things more efficient in our, app, in our application. We're not making things more parallel uh, because we're calling block all over the place. So there, there should be a way for us to try and uh, merge things in a way that, that is more efficient for, an applica for our application and in a way that, that helps us to uh, leverage the existing reactor operators to do things that are more complex and that are so complex that we couldn't really do that in an uh, imperative uh, model. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see what, what, what exactly. So the fact now that uh, the API actually represents, this is, an, this is an, uh, a call that involves latency and I.O., uh, the, the fact that you call block here tells you right in the API what's going on. So what we want to do is to leverage Project Reactor and the operator, since we have now Flux and Mono App Publisher from the Reactive Streams. Now, we have, now that we have that, uh, we can basically combine the data and define a pipeline right here, even though we, we're using Spring MVC. Mm -hmm. But it, it already works like this, right? It does, yes. So I've just restarted the app, and uh, as you can see, it's, it's, it's still working as before. But let's make it better. Uh, so one thing obvious, obviously we would like to do is to fetch the stats and the events and the top IPs at the same time in concurrently if the current resources allows that. And uh, basically replicate what we've done with parallel stream. So for every IP call our DNS resolver and do that also concurrently. So the first thing that we need to do is to stop calling block there which uh, gives us a mono, well, a publisher of the data. So we back to what it's supposed to be. Same thing for the event. And what I want is I want the list because um, remember that this, this actually returns a flux, not a mono of list. But there is an operator that you can call that's called collect list. So instead of getting elements one by one, it's buffering all elements and here, yeah. giving us uh, all those elements uh, as a list when everything's ready. So in our case, we're not interested in fluxes because our stats container object needs everything in one, in one go. So that's why we're, we're using collect list here. And the last thing that we want is we want the resolve reverse. What's the name of that thing again? There we go. Yeah. We want the top IPs again as a, as a mono of list. So let's, let's, let's do this one first, because we don't have it yet. So we can create a method that uh, basically return a flux of reverse hookup descriptor. So that's the uh, IP plus the reverse DNS information. So we need to get the top, top IPs and fetch the reverse DNS information for, for each one in a reactive way. So remember, on the, on the, with the previous API, what we did was calling having a blocking call to resolve, to get all the list of IPs and then use a stream so that for each of them, we would call the, the, the reverse recap. So let's do that again but with the new API. So we can fetch the top, top IPs We're here with the, from a specific, specific, specific date to another one. And then we need to apply for each element some operation and turn it into something. So if it were just a uh, transformation that involves no I.O. or no uh, reactive call, we could use just map and do something on that object. But here we, we want to do something that involves doing another layer of I.O. So we can use for that flat map and we'll see why. So with flat map means for each client we'll make another I.O. call uh, which will return uh, as well uh, another mono. So flat map is a bit about uh, it's a bit like a uh, flat map in streams, in, in JDK streams. It's uh, basically uh, uh, eliminating one, one layer of, uh, of reactive uh, operator, of, of, asynchronicity, of asynchronicity. 
So at this point, we still have done anything, right? We've defined a pipeline, we've defined uh, what should happen. Um, but what we need to do now is to combine all those events, all those three uh, data, and when, when, once we have the data, then do something. And to do this, there is an operator called zip, where you, you can give it as many publishers as you, as you like, and Reactor will make sure to, once you subscribe to this, to this publisher, make sure to trigger the necessary uh, calls. So zip will, uh, will uh, trigger all three at the same time, so all three operations will be started at the same time and happen concurrently, and whenever all three are back with a the result, then you can apply an operation to merge all, the, all that information into one object, and that's what we'd like. We'd like to get all that information into a stats, stats container uh, object with, with everything in it. Um, so as you can see, we're, it's a bit more descriptive. We, we have a few steps where we're describing what we'd like and how, and you're composing and creating a chain, and you don't really have to bother about when things are executed and how, because the way you're describing it uh, is enough, basically, to, to get this done. So uh, when zip is giving you a tuple, so it's, it's just a, a container object with everything in it, so with the first, with T1, T2, T3, with all the, the, three, the, the three elements we're waiting for, so this way, out of the tuple, we're getting the three elements we're waiting for. We're, we're creating our stats container object, and from there, we have a mono of stats container. So we built a pipeline that says, if you want a stats container, you have to call that method, get a mono, and you have to trigger it. You have to subscribe to it to get it eventually in a asynchronous, uh, non-blocking way. So that's actually happened in the controller when we feed the model right here. So in this case, we need to trigger our pipeline, and that's actually where we call black here. Yeah. Because that's the only place where we do it. Yeah, we're adding that to the model map, and in Spring MVC, the, the model map doesn't know how to deal with uh, reactive objects, and like WebFlux, where you can add a reactive uh, objects like Mono and Flux to uh, model map, and it works because it's resolved automatically for you. There we go. So here in this case, we know that things happen more in parallel, that we're, uh, we don't have that sequential uh, first part where we, we wait, we're waiting for the, the first three parts and then combining things. Uh, here we know that everything's happening as it comes, and we know that we're more efficient. But it's, uh, it's a beginning. We know that we're a bit more efficient. And it, it seems a bit more expressive, the way we've described it. But uh, I mean, it's we can say that uh, it's a bit hard to come by when, you, when you're not used to reactive. So for now, we, we're getting better performance, but was it really worth it uh, to, to do all of that? We're not getting uh, extra features or uh, extra behavior that we're interested in, really, besides the, the runtime uh, advantages. So you remember the free um, DNS resolver? We've told you that it can be uh, not non-reliable. Actually, the, the generator has this um, latency endpoint where you can tell the generator how to behave. And what I'm going to say is 80% 80, 80 of the calls that free DNS resolver should automatically add a random latency. And the latency is between 200 milliseconds to up to eight seconds. Right, so just to show you what happened if we do that. 80% is a lot because we're uh, making 10 calls, at least 10 calls per dashboard page because we have at least 10 top clients on our page. So 80% of 10 calls becomes to be quite noticeable on, on that page and we'll see, we'll see what it, what it, how it behaves. Um, you've also noticed the actuator um, prefix in this, um, in this um, request because latency is actually a custom actuator endpoint. That's also something new in Spring Boot 2 if you're interested to do it. It's very easy for you to create your own endpoint and it's mapped automatically to uh, a web endpoint or a GMXM bin and um, the, the, the sample repo will, will have a concrete example of that. So let's refresh and that's going to be really, really super bad there. It's slow, really slow, as expected. So yeah, it's taking a lot of time. So if you, if you encounter that kind of problem, 
Uh, and we, always, we already had that kind of problem in our existing Spring Boot 1.5 application. And that's why we had a, an ELF indicator for that. We, we created a, an indicator. Um, yeah, if you go to health, oh, you see that. OK, we, we don't nothing. see the details. So another feature in Spring Boot 2 is to let you customize how uh, details are being shown. And by default, details are never uh, being shown, but you, you can customize that. So there's a, there's a property you can use. It's called um, show details. And then you can select um, the mode in which details are being shown. So because I'm, I'm authorized to actually access this endpoint, I see now my reverse lookup uh, service. And it says up. Everything is fine. It's up. So from a pure health point of view, everything's fine in our application. But if you talk to your users, they won't say the same thing, probably. They're saying that everything's slow, that something's not working. And that's one of the limitations that we've seen quite a lot uh, with health indicators. Uh, developers tend to uh, use those sometimes to uh, not check that everything's available for the application to work, but uh, try to uh, use that as an observability kind of tool, which is maybe not the right tool in that, in that, in that case, because uh, that remote call will always be there. It will work in that case, but 80% of the time it will be really, really slow. And uh, this is really crashing our application and uh, making the behavior definitely not what we want. So in that case, we need a, a paradigm shift. We, we need to think about um, this, uh, this remote call as something that we need to observe, something that we need to uh, take metrics and, uh, and measure and, uh, and, and take a look on, um, on a particular uh, amount of time and maybe have SLAs and stuff like this. So here we're, we'd like to leverage uh, the new uh, micrometer support in Spring Boot 2 and turn that health, and check, health check into something that is more that, that has more uh, meaning to, to us in that case. So to, to configure a metric support um, via Micrometer, which is the, the library that we use in Spring Boot 2, uh, all you have to do basically is to choose your monitoring system and add the registry for it. And then the usual auto configuration will kick in and will export metrics automatically to the system that you've chosen. You can add more than one if you want to. In this case, we're going to use Prometheus. Uh, it's not actually running yet on my machine, so let me. So Prometheus do that. will be collecting uh, the data, th those metrics created by our application and all other instances, uh, by scrapping a specific endpoint on our application to get the raw metrics that are uh, instrumented and created on, in, in the application. Uh, but right now, as you can see in the logs, it's not really happy because it can't scrape data out of our application. And that's, in that case, it's probably a security issue because by default, everything's secure, and we haven't authorized that endpoint. So of course, you, yeah, you could configure Prometheus to uh, send the right thing. But this is a demo, so let's not do that. And just to show you a different way to uh, configure an endpoint, you could give it, a, give it the class, but if you don't want to import to the class directly, you can also use the ID of the endpoint. The use. Uh, this is not the path, right? So mm -hmm. if you customize the path, for instance, the, of the Earth endpoint, you rename it to status, for instance, because you prefer status than Earth, um, this will still work. Uh, so it, it will still work because there is an internal ID per endpoint, and this is what you need to put here. So if, you, if we go to the Earth endpoint, for instance, you can see it as a, an ID defined here, regardless of the mapping. OK, right. so now Prometheus should be able to get data out of our application, collect all the metrics that are created automatically by Spring Boot. So when you get Actuator, you get both Micrometer and all the instrument, instrumentation code that, we've, uh, uh, that we wrote. So it's instrumenting the JVM, uh, Spring MVC, Spring Web Flocks, uh, a bunch of things, REST template. Uh, so a lot of things are instrumented automatically, and you get a lot of metrics out of the box for free. So if you look at Prometheus, uh, when it, it will scrape a lot, of, a lot of metrics. So from Tomcat to uh, data source, uh, data source uh, metrics 
to, in our case, we're mostly interested in what's happening on our server and the uh, average latency or average response time we're getting from our, our, uh, our home page. There we go. So um, what we can see here quickly is, uh, let, me, let me zoom in again. So this is the free IP um, thing, and we can see here that the max is 7.7 .7 seconds. So we have this, in, this information, but that's pretty rule, right? So yeah, what you we want to do is look at metrics like this. No, probably not. So there, there's another project that you can use uh, called Grafana uh, that will give you a bit more uh, context. So let's actually look at one of the dashboards that we have. So with Grafana, you can create dashboards that will exploit all the collected metrics. And from that, you can uh, define your own dashboards, look at uh, uh, various JVM metrics, maybe define SLAs, and look at uh, various levels of, of things. So you, you can really define uh, really precise dashboards that are meaningful to your application uh, to, to its health. And we forgot to do something, actually, is this dashboard uh, oh, yeah. expects a tag uh, named application. Um, and you need to give it a value that's identifying your app. So if you, if you use a, a single Grafana dashboard to monitor multiple apps, each app has a different application name, and that's how you basically switch from one, from, from one to the other. And yeah. Forgot to do that, so let's do that quickly. Yeah, micrometer metrics are multidimensional. So for example, for a given response time, you get several tags on it. So you can get like the URI of the request, you can get the HTTP status, you can get the application name, etc. So that way you can uh, you can use uh, specific queries to, to ask, okay, what's the mean average response time of all the 200 res responses for that application and on that specific endpoint, et cetera, et cetera. So you can really tailor your queries and, and see what's going on in a specific part of your application. So the tags are really helpful here. And uh, for common tags, th those tags, the, those are the tags that are added no matter what on every metric created on that application instance. So you can say, uh, the application name, or you could say that application lives into region US East or something like this, you know, the data center name, whatever. There you go. So if we want to add a graph, uh, it's actually pretty easy to do. Let me open that up a bit. What I want to do is I want to see the HTTP server request max. That's the one. And I want to constrain that for an application uh, with that, that variable. And that variable is actually what you get here on top of this dashboard. So by the way, Grafana has this notion of shared dashboard. So if you go to the Grafana website, you can search for dashboard. This is a dashboard that has been made specifically for Micrometer and the Spring Boot app. So the one that you see has no customization whatsoever. So if you go to Grafana and you search Spring Boot, you'll get an ID and you can import that ID in your local Grafana instance and you'll get this. Um, brackets, are you sure, or is it? Uh, oh yeah, I'm doing that mistake squiggly, again. Squiggly yes, ones. it's not a function, right? It's to constrain with tags, so there we go. Okay. Um, well, I don't have data points at this point, I should. So whenever something happens on your application, uh, metrics are created, then they're, they're put in some kind of queue and then collected uh, by Prometheus and then you can see things uh, live on a dashboard. Oh, that's because I chose client ceiling. Uh, that's yeah. server. Okay. There we go. So then you, you can get the data right here, and you can see that the legend is pretty horrible. So let's actually tell it to use the URI. Then you get something like this. Okay, so we know that web jars, pretty flat. Uh, so serving static resources was not the problem in our case. In this case, it's definitely the endpoint, the stats endpoint that fetching all the data. So that's where our, our problem is. And uh, so if you had a lot of pages, this is a nice way to know this is where the problem is. So of course, we still don't know at this point that the DNS resolver is the problem, right? Uh, we can't see that because we, we are actually looking at the server metrics. What we would like to do is rather monitor the client metrics, so what the web client is doing. And for that, uh, it's a Spring Boot to one feature. Yeah, we didn't have uh, web, full web client instrumentation in 2.0, so if you want that feature, you definitely want it. Uh, you have to migrate to 2.1. So uh, luckily in this case, 
uh, a 2021 migration is uh, a lot easier. You just change the version and hopefully nothing, you don't have anything to change. And even in that case, we added like interesting features, especially the common tags. So instead of having to write a, uh, a, a, custom, a customizer to add that tag, you can just add a property uh, as, a, as a map and you can add all the custom tags into your configuration properties files and uh, done. Right, so let's restart our app with 2.1 now. So now we should have the metrics, the existing server metrics, but we should have the instrumentation for our web client. So we should get information about what's happening when web client is requesting information from uh, remote services. So we can ask the maximum amount of seconds for the responses for the web client for our given application. And if we're trying to get a few requests and a bit of traffic on our application, we should see metrics coming in. So yeah, in this case, you can see that all the lines are really flat and no problem on most APIs. And the one that's problematic is the reverse lookup, the free one. So we knew it was this, but it's a nice way to see where the, problem, where the problems are. Uh, if you add instrumentation and if you have that for free, especially, uh, you can create uh, dashboards and have a, a, a good look and a good, uh, and a good vision on your, on your application. So using Max is really super important because if, even if you, if you compute an average latency, like the graph on your left, uh, it will tell you that, okay, around three seconds is the average latency for this service. And even if you use 99% 99, 99 uh, of the request, you're still missing the 1% that could go terribly wrong. So that's why having the two uh, can give you a, a full picture. So the max tells you that there are requests that almost took eight seconds. Um, then you can do something like this. Um, this, is, this is a different graph that we are going to show you uh, in a demo in a minute that basically counts the number of uh, requests to the free resolver. And uh, what we are going to introduce now is a way to fall back automatically to the costly one, the paying one, if something like that happens. So let's say you're using REST templates and you want to configure some kind of timeout and say, if that amount of time is spent already, then I want to fall back to another, another call, uh, things like this. So either your client library is supporting some kind of, client, uh, of, some kind of timeout which will be global to the client, or you can try and enforce uh, in an imperative way uh, some kind of timer and then throw exceptions and do concurrent programming manually. Uh, if you've tried that already, it's really hard uh, and it's uh, even harder to test, really. Uh, so that's where uh, the mono and flux upper, uh, types and the operators are really helpful, and we'll see how we can achieve that in an easy way. So you've seen this auto-completion for application properties. Just qu one quick question. Um, yeah. Who knows that you can actually use that system for your own keys? Application keys, library, who knows that? Not a lot. Oh, wow. OK. OK. So yeah, the, so the, yeah you can. The auto-completion auto and all the keys that, that are available in application.properties, it's super easy to create your own. You just need to create a Pojo class have uh, attributes. So here we've defined a duration, which is a type that is supported as of Spring Boot 2.0. So instead of saying this type is the number of milliseconds or seconds, or you know the timeouts, everybody's saying it's uh, using a different unit. So you can use uh, duration, a POJO annotated with configuration properties, and define the namespace. So here we'll, we're, de we're defining dashboard. You can use a clever Javadoc <laughs> comment to de describe what, what's going on, uh, what, what you'd like it to be. It, it, is, it is a proper description. And, uh, and your ID is uh, usually telling you that if you're defining your own configuration uh, properties, you can use a, a, an annotation processor. So the processor will automatically create the metadata that the IDs will use to, uh, to, to tell you uh, interesting things in your uh, ID. So, sorry. Oh, the question is: Is it also available for different profiles? Yeah, it's a regular configuration uh, key, just like uh, the Spring Boot ones. We're, we're actually defining keys that way in Spring Boot, and we're making that available to all applications. 
So that way, if, you, if, you've, if you've got the annotation processor, the ID knows where to find the metadata and you get auto-completion in your ID for your own properties. So that's really helpful. And uh, if you know the duration format, there is an ISO format to express a duration in Java. That's, I mean, for simple duration, is quite hard to read. So what we've done is a simpler solution where you can simply put a number, an amount, and then a unit. So in this case, you can see it has been detected automatically at 500 milliseconds. But if I want to configure two seconds, for instance, I can just type this, and that's going to inject a duration of two seconds. So now we've defined a property to say we want the timeout for those remote calls to be 500 milliseconds by default, and we can change that with, with our configuration key. And we'd like to leverage that in our stat service. Um, so whenever we are using the reverse lookup client for the free service, we'd like to set a timeout and say, if that operation is taking more time than this amount of time, then you should use the, the paying version as a fallback. So we'll use the, client, the, the free one whenever it behaves correctly. And in case of, pro, in case of issues, we'll use the paying, the, the paying version. So the way to do this, and you're back basically with the reactor operators that you can use. So there's plenty, plenty of operations you can apply. So in this case, there is a, a timeout operator where you, where you can specify the timeout or something that's going to compute the timeout. And then you can provide a, an alternative publisher. And reactor will take care of, take that into account and it, it will switch automatically to a different publisher if it needs to. And with, it will cancel the, the request as well to, to the first one. So it will close the resources and everything. So here, if that timeout is reached, then we'll use the paying version instead. So with the same uh, latency involved in our application, you can see that it's almost instantly. Uh, you're getting that response almost instantly. And you can see now that it's completely flat on the max because the max can't go higher than 500 milliseconds because if that happens, we switch automatically to the other one. And if we take a look at the, what's going on on, our, on the web client metrics, yeah, so we should see that. Uh, Those ones, yeah. Yeah, we, sh we should see that now we're using the paying version. Uh, before we weren't using it. Now we're using the free and the paying version at a different rate. And, uh, and that rate should actually mirror what's going on uh, in, our, in our remote service, the, the way we've configured. We said 80% of the request should have an insane amount of latency. And more or less, in our dashboard, you'd see that 80% of the, of the request should go to the paying version, and 20% should go to the free version automatically, because we're, we're reaching that timeout. So this is pretty much what we, what we can see here, where we have 50 uh, called to uh, the costly one and 20 to the free one. So let's change the, the, let's change the ratio and see what the impact can be. So if we lower it to 20% instead of 80%, uh, that's going to change the, the, the dynamic of the service. Let's give it some more calls there. Still fast. Still fast. And then you can see that the free one takes over uh, because there's absolutely no need to use the costly one now because of the reduced latency. So this is also a way to easily see what happens on your service. And you, you get that pretty much out of the box. The only thing you have to do is configure the registry and we'll publish metrics uh, for all kinds of things. But now the question is, what happens if you'd like to measure some metric of your own that is not uh, created or instrumented automatically by Spring Boot? We're covering a lot already. But in this case, for example, when you're calling the, the free version of our, uh, of our uh, uh, reverse lookup uh, API, you can see that there's an X rate limit remaining uh, header saying that we're allowed to make uh, 23 or 20 or whatever uh, requests and then will be banned for a few seconds from the service. So this is something we'd like to uh, keep in mind, and we'd like to have some kind of dashboard or indicator uh, to see that if we're about to, uh, to, to, uh, to extend too much uh, the number of requests we, we did on that free API. So you don't see the rate limiting decreasing because what we're using is, is a library that allows us to do 25 seconds per 10 seconds, 25 calls per 10 seconds, and it will put new calls uh, automatically, so it's not like a 10 seconds period where you can invoke the mm -hmm. service 25. It will like refill the bucket as time goes. But basically what we have now is this uh, header, 
And what we would like to show you now is how you can create a custom metric with that information and use Grafana to show something. So for that, you need to instrument uh, that part of your application and create that metric and give it a name. And it will follow the rest. It will be scribed by Prometheus, and you, you'll be able to create a graph and something in your own dashboard. Uh, so you can do whatever you want. So in web clients, uh, there is no interceptor. It's actually called exchange filter function. It's a, it's a filter. Uh, with a filter, you can do something to the request before it goes out. You can then execute the thing, get the response back, and maybe wrap or change something to the response. So it's really a filter. In this case, we're not interested in changing the request. We'll just like to send the request, and whenever there's a response coming back, on, so on the unnext, we'd like to extract the information from the response, uh, which will be a, a header, the X rate limit remaining. We'd like to extract that information and create a metric out of it. So if that rate limit information is there, we'd like to create a gauge uh, with that metric. Um, so here we're getting a, an integer from that, but we need to create a metric first to get that information into that metric. A way to create a metric, you just need to inject the met meter registry, create a gauge out of it, so you just name it. So here it was rate limit remaining. <laughs> That, that, like it was dashboard dot rate limit dot remaining something okay. like that. So we, whatever we we can change, it doesn't matter. And uh, you need to give it something. So here in this case, an atomic integer uh, will do the job. So you're instrumenting that thing. So it's observed by by micrometer. And uh, whenever we get that integer value, we can set it to our gauge. So the gauge will take the current number of remaining calls uh, instantly. Whenever there is a request and response coming back on that client, it'll be in instrumented and you're looking for, yeah, okay. There we go, and then I can use that small thing to look at much smarter. Make it lambda, there we go. and you need to use it into the filter of course, function. Of so uh, in the builder phase, whenever you're building the, the client, there are many ways to, uh, to um, customize the client. Here we can add a filter. And you, okay, we can add a filter and use the filter we've just defined uh, here, the right. rate limiting one. So that, that's one use case where you can use the meter registry to create additional metrics and have your own business logic um, actually uh, expose metrics the same way as we do. So if I do that, I should normally see a, a new metric. A new metric. So here we we'll, should see dashboard dot dashboard. rate limit remaining. There we go. I have this. Okay. I have the value. So once you, once you have that, then you can do small things like uh, let's go to our dashboard, this one, and I can create a new single stat and give it the same thing. Once you know how to do it, it's, it's actually quite easy. Uh, that's the first part that's a bit annoying because you need to understand all those concepts. But basically, I'm going to create a single stat for this metric. So I can see the value here. It's not really like, like I want, so I'm going to customize that a bit. So what I want to show is, um, sorry, I want, I want to see the current value, current value not an average. Yeah. And I want to um, show a gauge. And we know that the maximum uh, that we're allowed is 25 by default. So if you do that, you know that currently you're, we're allowed to do seven more, and you know the min and maximum. And, um, and uh, with a gauge, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, a, it's a kind of metric that, uh, that is updated whenever something happens. So uh, it's not something that is calculated uh, constantly. So whenever uh, a request comes through our, our indicator, the gauge is updated. So it will remain seven, even though in reality it's not seven anymore. So that way, if we're doing a few more calls, it will be updated. So there you go. We've got a 2.1 application instrumented. We've solved our uh, performance problems. It's, it's still a Spring MVC application, but it's doing uh, a lot more things. We, we've covered new features and a new use case that we couldn't cover before. 
so the question is, does it alert uh, alert things if uh, if uh, if you go under? You, you can in a dashboard and in the in depending on the registry and depending on the tool you're using, you can definitely set up SLAs and alerts and uh, even complex one because it, it's usually uh, not if this value is under that you can define like if if it's uh, at least five times under that value within five minutes or, or so so you can really tweak uh, those alerts in a more clever way uh, so not just mean but maybe max or or uh, there you go but so, that's that's more a feature of the monitoring system that yeah. you use so you It, it could, if, if the monitoring system has that feature, I mean, it depends on the monitoring um, system that you're going to choose. Uh, I'm sure there are many that have that feature. Yeah. So we have some time for question, maybe? Four minutes. Yeah. Uh, what, we, what we meant to show you also is how you can configure SSL and how you can enable HTTP2 with your service. So when, we will tweet the link to the repo, and there is a branch um, called HTTP2. And if you check out that and you use a uh, recent JDK, because um, you need at least Java 9 uh, yeah. to get the proper TLS version, um, then you'll get HTTP2 basically out of the box. Mm. So someone had a question, I think. Yeah, go ahead. So do we have metrics for the... Question is, do we have metrics for authentication providers? Is that it? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Really, we, have a met we have a lot of metrics and instrumentation for a lot of things. Some of them are provided by Spring Boot itself. Some of them are provided by Micrometer. Um, but for each request, you can see if, for instance, the request has been denied, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you, you basically get the HTTP status. It's a tag. Uh, so you can filter things based on that tag, for instance. Actually, in the Grafana dashboard, there is a, there is a case where, um, because you invoke the service too much, it starts the DNS resolver. It starts saying ref refusing to serve the request. And then you can see the dashboard, that kind of stuff. You can filter very easily. OK. So if you've got other questions, please come and uh, we can talk. Thank you. Thanks.